be appropriate this weekend. But that could also apply to our relationship with God. Yes. Which came first, man's need for relationships with God, or did God have a need of relationship with man? Here's the answer. 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first what? Loved us. Loved us. And this and other verses tell us clearly that even though we were created by God, he wanted to have a relationship with us. Isn't that wonderful? When Adam was first created from the dust, he was the only human on the planet. But you know, God said it wasn't good for man to be alone, and so he created who? Eve. And she was called woman because, you know, Adam looked at her and said, whoa, man. Yeah. And now, 7.4 billion people later, there's people everywhere, and yet, in this society, we have never been more alone. Did you know that? We're very isolated. When I went to Europe, I couldn't believe it, because people don't live in the country. They always go to the store. They meet each other every day. They walk all the villages. And here in America, people go home and watch their TV and they are by themselves. And yet, we really crave relationships. And here's the deal. It's very important that we spend time with God soaking in the Word and reading His Word and talking to Him. But He didn't have, he didn't have a plan for us to be isolated. And yet, we are very isolated. We um, should have an, a desire to spend time with people and share good news and share things that happen to us in frustration. I don't know who you connect with, but God made us to connect with other people. In one day, can you think of who you would connect with? Anybody? You might connect with who? Neighbors. Neighbors would be a possibility. Who else? Spouse or family. Yes. Okay. Taxi, grocery store, lawn care people, maybe grandchildren, maybe spouses. And yet, um, those are the people that we can actually represent God to. So we really are supposed to be doing that. There are seven health benefits from sharing a healthy relationship with people. And here's some of them. People involved in loving relationships, not stressful relationships, have fewer doctor visits. Any of you want to go to the doctor less? And they have shorter hospital visits. And they have less pain. Did you know that? They actually had couple, well, they had people, I don't know who goes to these research things and is willing to do it, but they had people they shocked and they felt the shots. So then they had their lab people hold the hand of that person and the person said they only felt the shock like 80, 70%. And then they called up somebody significant to them, and they had them hold their hand, and they said that they only felt it about 40%. Same amount of shock. So it's very important that we're around people. And then people who are with other people and more socialized live longer. They heal quicker. They have lower blood pressure. Isn't that interesting? And stronger immune systems. If we have low immune system, what happens? We get sick more often. And then they also said that we manage our stress and that makes us more resilient. And more people who have significant relationships with people report that they feel joy and happiness more often. There's also a review of 148 studies on social ties that found that people with strong relationships were how much percent? 50% less likely to die early than people without such support. Can you imagine that? Somebody was telling me about someone they knew and they, they were in the hospital by themselves and they died and they felt so bad that they were all alone but nobody got called when they got in the hospital. That's kind of a hard way to go. And here is another study. A lack of social relationships was equivalent to what? Smoking up to how many cigarettes a day? 15, 6, so like you want to be healthy, you need to be around people. We need community. And our community might be family. It might be hobbies. It might be people that we do things with. I think a church is a wonderful place to get community with. And it's not only 
that we just meet people, but we meet people with all ages and stages of life. That's a really good thing. Community should never feel boring or forced. But Psalm 133.1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Isn't that nice? And, you know, sometimes it's fun to go to church or to a community where you hear some, something that is humorous or encouraging. It should be a good thing. Communities of, of believers attract the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what it says in Matthew 18, 20? Wherever two or more are gathered, we can expect what? The Holy Spirit to be here. You know, we've asked the Holy Spirit to be here with us tonight. And another example was in the early church of the Acts, which made a habit of meeting together, eating together, and worshiping. And that was in Acts 2, 46. So being in a community is definitely important. Community fosters love, and it tests to see if we're growing in love. Have you ever noticed that the worst parts of your, of your personality come out when you're irritated with people? And maybe if you were living by yourself, you never would be tested. So it's really important for us to get those things straightened out. Colossians 3.13 says, Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them in perfect unity. So we want unity. Amen. It's also life-giving and essential. Scripture says that because we're better together than we are alone, it says in Romans 12, 4. And you know, people who get hurt, or somebody who dies, or somebody who's been really um, brokenhearted for something, they usually will isolate. Do you think it's a healthy thing to isolate? It reminds me of this. My husband and I, we were in South Africa in August. And who was the one that got hurt the most? But the animals that were on the edge of the group that were isolated, and it was like the lions knew who they could go over there and get because they were vulnerable and they were open to, uh, you know, they didn't have anything around them. And so we have to be careful. And Paul said in Corinthians, bear with one another, forgive one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds us all together in perfect unity. So we want to be together. Have you heard of the birds of a feather flock together? Yes. Oh, my mother always said that. And you know, who you associate will often make an influence. I think that I heard Marty say the other day, maybe it was him, about if I want to be a good golfer, then I hang out with good golfers, and some after a while I become a good golfer because that's what I talk and think about. And you know, when you're with people who study the Bible and want to do things right, it's a real positive influence on you. So make sure that you're associating with good people. And then there's another thing that says, growing research has demonstrated a link between our spiritual well-being and our better health. We want to grow, don't we, in Christ? And so make sure that you're hanging out with people. So I have some verses that I'd like you to help me read. Because, you know, some of us might be lonely, and some of us haven't worked on our relationships yet because we have to cultivate it and get busy doing it. But let's say that you're alone so we can remember this no matter who we are. You ready? And, oh, read it with love in your heart. Is that okay? How precious are your thoughts to me, oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more in numbers than the grains of isn't that wonderful to know he's thinking about you? And then here's another promise that God gives us for hope. Are you ready? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. And here's one more because we just have to finish this up. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. Remember that you need to work on your socialization. If it's slowing and you haven't gotten involved with anyone lately, make sure that you're working on it. Make friends. Have you made a new friend since you've been coming to the meetings? Make sure that you talk to people. And again, remember that you are going to influence all the people in your circle that other people may not have any other, you know, they aren't around your family or your neighbors. And God wants you to influence them for Him. And you are going to be showing people what God is like by your love. God can improve your life, and he will bless you abundantly. Just obey him and study more about him. This is like the beginning of the last, the 
last meeting. This is the beginning of the rest of your life. Fire me up now. I'm going to go to the my experience. We thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for your love and your watch care over us. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. I pray, Father, that you would bless us tonight, that you would bless Royce as he leads out, that you, your words would be his words. And, Father, we want to thank you for creating us, and then we want to thank you for redeeming us, and we look forward to your restoration. And you... We praise you and we thank you because you are worthy of all thanks and praise and glory and honor is yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. some of those details, perhaps from a perspective that you've not thought of before. On Friday, Jesus fulfilled his mission to save the world from sin by dying on the cross as the sacrificial lamb so long prophesied. And then on the next day, on Sabbath, in the quietness of the tomb, he rested. His sacrificial work as Savior of the world was finished. But the next day, the first day of the week, Christ rose from the grave, the victor over Satan's attempts to destroy him. Is that good news? Yes. After Christ rose from the grave, he spent many days with the disciples. In one last meeting with the disciples, Jesus gave them some final instructions. He said, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes to you. And then, what happened? Well, according to the author of Acts, who happens to be <coughs> Luke, the physician who wrote the book of Luke, he says, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out, out of him out of their sight. Jesus ascended to heaven. The Passion Week was over. The disciples had spent 40 days with the resurrected Christ. When the days were over, Jesus left his disciples. 
While the disciples gazed in wonder into the heavens, two angels stood by them and said, This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The gospel story, the good news story of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, his death, his burial, his resurrection, had all played out. We come to the end of the Passion Week end, and this is where most people stop the story. Jesus was resurrected. He went back to heaven. End of story. Really? That's all there is? Not according to the Bible. Do you want a glimpse into the rest of the story? Amen. I think you do because that's probably why you came here tonight. And so I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse. I can't show you everything, but I want to show you a couple significant pieces. I'm going to first start, though, with a little story from history. This one seemed to fit right in with this particular area of Florida. Why? Because the Space Center is right here. How many of you have seen a rocket go up? See, look at that. i got to put my hand down. Except on television. But I've not seen one in all the real life. Well, I want to remind you of this historical event. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged the Congress of the United States of America with these words. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. I was nine years old, no, eight years old when that happened, and I had no idea he'd even said that. But I did know about it later. And when President Kennedy said these words, the goal seemed unlikely. But less then a decade later, in July 20, on July 20 of 1969, Neil Armstrong step, stepped onto the moon 235,000 miles from planet Earth. Along with Michael Collins and Ed Buzz Aldrin, Armstrong flew to the moon aboard Apollo 11. It took about four days to get there. And you have to understand, they were really moving to get there. They traveled about 80,000 miles a day. Hey, that's not bad, you know. Wish we could do that on the freeway, right? Or about 4,000 miles an hour. Then Aldrin and Armstrong spent almost an entire day on the moon. They were the very first men to ever leave footsteps there. They landed on the moon in a lunar module called, anybody remember? the eagle. And when they landed, Neil Armstrong uttered those memorable words, which everyone at the Space Center was waiting to hear, or Houston, or wherever they were, the eagle has landed. Then as Armstrong stepped off of the eagle and onto the surface, surface of the moon, Armstrong said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Those words have been immortalized in history. A message to the world, if you please, from outer space. Well, as significant as that event was in the history of mankind, that message was not nearly as essential to man as the messages from outer space, the messages from Jesus in heaven to his people here on this earth. Amen. I want to give you the backstory to those messages first. See, John, who became the prophet John, first the apostle John, the disciple with Jesus. John was an old man by the time this particular part of the story comes around. And he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos. 
When he was young, he followed Jesus around everywhere. After the ascension, John served his Lord, carrying the gospel to all who would be willing to listen. But then he was taken prisoner by the Romans and sent to the Isle of Patmos. Understand, no planes and really slow ships. And understand it was a prison isle, so it was not one you just went off and on whenever you chose to. While there, Jesus sent John messages from outer space. I mean the real deal. They were messages for John and for God's people to encourage and instruct them. Messages from Jesus. Yes. Remember, he walked with Jesus. He had prayed to Jesus. And how thrilling it must have been to the age John to hear from Jesus once again with messages of hope and encouragement. These are some of the things that Jesus said through the angel that spoke to him. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. John, writing this, said, This is John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the, seven, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn, and from the dead, I'm sorry, and the ruler over the kings of earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, Amen. John is speaking of his friend, and his God, and his Creator, Jesus Christ. And he's encouraged because Jesus came to him and said, I'm still alive. Yes. And I have a message for you. As a matter of fact, I have many messages for you. He said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Again, he said. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. I don't know about you, but I want to know. Who's got the keys to Hades and to death? Because the one who has the keys to death can unlock that door. And he can let death go away. Destroy it forever. And bring life back again. Jesus wants us to know he's alive today. And because he's alive, we can live forever. That's what he wants us to know. So let me summarize what these verses say. They tell us that Jesus is alive and well. That Jesus gives John prophetic messages that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. That is, he was resurrected. That Jesus is the ruler over the world. That Jesus is alive forevermore. That Jesus has the keys of Hades and death. That Jesus is coming again. Amen. Is that good news? Amen. Revelation is a message from the living, resurrected Christ, Jesus. The Bible tells us he sent a message back from heaven. He said, I'm in here in heaven. I'm still alive. And he wants us to know that he's coming again. That's fantastic news. We can stop there and go home. But we're not. Because there's more. Amen. There's important words for us. Back in Revelation chapter 14, we've looked a couple of times already there, but we haven't covered all that these messages give to us. So slip back in your Bibles to Revelation 14, and we'll look at that a little bit more this evening. What more does Revelation tell us about the work of Jesus right now? Is it enough to know that He's in heaven? Yes, it is enough to know. But He wants us to know more, so He has told us more. 
And that's because he wants us to get better acquainted with him and to understand what he's trying to do for us. Because if we know what he's doing for us, then when we pray to him and we connect with him, we'll be able to connect more with him in relationship to what he wants us to know. So if you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the pew in front of you. We're going to look at the book of Revelation. It's the last book of the Bible. You can find it right near the end, as long as there's not a, a commentary or something at the end. So the very last book of the Bible says Revelation. And we're going to look at verse 14 and especially verse 17. Now we've looked at some verses already, but we're going to look at more. And they're going to be up on the screen, and you'll be able to follow right along. Here's the message we want to zero in on tonight. We read verse 6 earlier, but now we're going to look at verse 7 of chapter 14. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Now I really want you to follow along with the message tonight, but remember that we've said a lot in the last three days. I'll try to bring you up to speed on parts of it so that you understand that this is not the only part of the message. But we'll look at that again. You may have noticed as we have been studying in Revelation 14 and verses 6 and 7, I've had it up on the screen once or twice, this passage that says the hour of His judgment has come. But you noticed I haven't said much about it. Almost nothing about it. And you know what? I did it on purpose. The reason I did it is because it's time now to consider this section. We need to know what this is about. It says here on the screen with me, say it with me so that it really registers. Here it is. The hour of his judgment has come. You know what? Judgment sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? You know, when you think about going to court and judgment, that just sounds really bad. Unless somebody's accusing you of something you didn't do, and you go to court, and you find out that the judge says, oh, I'm just going to throw it out. That's always good news, isn't it? I remember once I got a ticket. I was doing something that I thought was okay to do. Honest, I really thought it was okay to do it. But it turned out it probably wasn't okay. And so I decided, though, that I needed to go to court. What I did, just so that you don't, you know, what you don't know makes you worry a little bit, I passed a car on the right. But the car was stopped making a left turn. I thought it was perfectly fine there because I thought there was a little turn lane to do that. Turns out that was just to go to the right and not to keep going. At any rate, so I went to court. And I listened as the judge sat there telling this person they had this fine and they had that other thing and all that. And I was ready for my moment in court. But one thing I noticed about the judge, he seemed to be in a good mood. I hope that was a good sign. And I found out the reason that he was in a good mood is because it was his birthday. The day I chose to go to court. Hey, that was a good thing for me. At any rate, I gave him my case. And he looked at uh, what the policeman had said. And fortunately, I had been a good boy that day. And I was nice to the policeman, which I always try to be nice to policemen. And, and he also said, well, the policeman didn't show up. He said, case dismissed. I was a happy boy. Well, I was a happy man. I was happy that day because of what the judge did. So, judgment doesn't have to be fearful, but just the idea is kind of scary for us. Well, I want to repeat myself. I've been doing it for the last three days, so you're used to it. But I want to remind you that the Bible is consistent from the beginning to the end. The Bible is constantly connecting the important pieces and events and principles together. It is easy to miss important details by assuming that we already know what's being said. And we already know all of the story. This morning, I showed you some things that might have really surprised you. And you might not have known it. You thought that Jesus just rested in the grave. Yes, he did. But you didn't realize, perhaps, what the significance was. And we talked about that. That's another story. But by careful study, we can see the connecting pieces, and suddenly the Bible comes alive. This passage we just read in Revelation chapter 14 tells us that the hour of judgment has come. 
If you just simply float on by that without digging into it, without comparing the pieces from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, you'd miss the significance of that simple phrase, the hour of judgment has come. But we've already gone back into Daniel. On Thursday night we did that. Kind of put a lot of weight and a little indigestion into your mind as we went through that whole prophecy in Daniel 8, 8 verse 14 and following. But I want to remind you of what we learned there. First of all, it was a time.